an unusual clay cylinder, broken into several fragments and inscribed in cuneiform script, represents the most powerful symbol of religious tolerance and multiculturalism in the ancient world. I am Cyrus, king of the four quarters of the world. I sought the safety of the city of Babylon and all its sanctuaries. As for its population, I soothed their weariness and freed them from their bondage. Cyrus the Great is the visionary who is globally revered for this cylinder heralded by many to be the first declaration of human rights. Yet this ancient cylinder is only a part of his celebrated legacy. Over two and a half thousand years ago, Cyrus the Great built one of the greatest and most extraordinary capitals on Earth, from which he ruled most of the then known world. His capital city was called Pasargade. It was here in Pasargade that a lavish and truly spectacular garden scheme known as Paridaisa was first introduced. The evocative Persian word Paridaisa, meaning a luxuriant garden, was later to be transcribed into Greek and Latin to become the word we still use today, paradise. thousand years after Cyrus, however, crumbling ruins are all that remain of his paradise city. Yet today, with the help of collective archaeological excavations, predominantly those conducted by Professor David Stronach between 1961 and 1963, and modern geomagnetic surveys carried out by joint Iranian and French experts, we can see Pasargade in ways that were never possible before. In order to fill in the historical gaps of what survives, there is fortunately a plentiful source of information from Persepolis, another Archimenid site of the first Persian Empire which was created following the architectural models established at Pasargade. Also, large collections of magnificent artifacts from that period are displayed at many museums around the world. Together, these help us to develop a composite reconstruction of the landscape, the buildings, and the ambiance of Pasargade, this wonderful World Heritage Site, in its entire and dazzling splendor. Creating Pasargade, Cyrus the Great's Paradise. To understand some of the history of Iran, we need to trace the origins of its people. The Iranians were one branch of the Indo-European population who inhabited the Eurasian plains. Five thousand years ago, these people made a significant change to transport, 
by domesticating the horse. This enabled them to move faster, travel further, and settle in distant lands such as Europe, northern India, and Iran. Of those tribes who came to the Iranian plateau, the Medes settled in the northwestern part, and the Persians occupied the south central portion of the plateau. It was the union between the Medes and the Persians that radically changed the course of history in the ancient world. The man who unified them was Cyrus. In time, he became known as Cyrus the Great. His passion captivated hearts. His courage inspired a nation. Within 11 years, Cyrus and his people had created an empire which spanned across three continents. In fact, this was the largest empire the world had ever seen. Thus, for more than two centuries, people from Greece to Mesopotamia and from Libya to India came to regard the sovereign on the throne of Persia as the king of kings. Ahead of his time, Cyrus the Great's extraordinary vision of a society based on religious and cultural tolerance inspired the foundation of a fabulous empire. His famous cylinder, now preserved at the British Museum, is considered by many to be the very first declaration of human rights in the world. The Cyrus Cylinder was inscribed on the orders of Cyrus after he captured Babylon in 539 BC. First, of course, um, he describes how he conquered Babylon. Um, secondly, and this is perhaps uh, more important, um, he makes it clear that deported peoples, people that had been brought to Babylon by the, by the King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, were going to be allowed to return home. History is filled with the narratives of kings. They talk about the conquest of peoples. They recite the details of how many cities they've overthrown. Only one king in history at this time, Cyrus, talks about the release of enslaved peoples to go back to their homeland. Amongst these enslaved peoples were the Jews in Babylon. What the Cyrus Cylinder does is to confirm two things. One, that Cyrus was certainly an enlightened and sympathetic ruler who didn't regard military conquests as an opportunity for uh, rape and, and, and theft and, and abuse and all the things that in, in the ancient and more modern world armies usually do. And uh, the impression one gets from the cuneiform certainly matches the image of Cyrus in the Bible. Ko amar Adonai lemshicho lekoresh asher hechzakti beimino lared lefanav goyim Cyrus introduced in the Bible uh, especially in the uh, book of Isaiah, the only foreign ruler that called my shepherd and my anointed one, Mishichi. Um, it is very positive attitude towards uh, the foreign ruler. Uh, and we do not have any match for it uh, in, in the entire Bible. Thus the Lord said to Cyrus, his anointed one, 
whose right hand he has grasped, treading down nation before him, ungirding the loins of kings, opening doors before him, and letting no gate stay shut. I will march before you and level the hills that loom up. I will shatter doors of bronze and cut down iron bars. I will give you treasures concealed in the dark. We mustn't think that the greatness of Osiris was limited to the Jewish people. From what we understand of the few scattered pieces of evidence we have, uh, he was benevolent to many peoples. Cyrus the Great had in fact established the first multiracial, multi-faith and multicultural society to have ever existed. We all know how Cyrus freed the Jews from captivity in Babylonia so they could return to their homelands. But this was not the only case. It happened later in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah as officers of the king who came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. They did the same thing in Egypt and in Babylonia and among the Greeks of Asia Minor. In fact, they are the first example of international religious freedom that we find in the history of mankind. Persian kings must have loved splendid gardens and paid great attention to the conservation of nature. This is most evident in the exceptional design of Cyrus the Great's capital city, Pasagarde. Vital clues to the special blueprint of Pasagarde lie in recent geomagnetic investigations carried out at the site by joint Iranian and French scientists headed by Dr. Rémy Boucherla. This survey, which was implemented during six seasons, each lasting for three to four weeks, covered an area of 45 hectares out of the whole park area, which is about 300 hectares. Our findings from our geomagnetic surveys show that, unlike other ancient cities, there was no rampart or military fortification surrounding this huge complex at Pasagarde. A capital city without fortification was quite unique in the ancient world. Babylon and Persepolis, for instance, had massive fortifications. The round city of Ardeshir, the founder of the Sassanid dynasty in Persia, had not just one, but three layers of fortified walls. And the famous city of Bam is another good example that had highly condensed fortifications. So, why was Pasagarde so different? There was, in fact, no rampart up to the gate. It was uh, on level ground, and the wall was no more than a low temenus wall, a kind of fence, if you will, that simply delineated the limits of this open and, broadly speaking, very welcoming site. And I think that Cyrus may have been quietly emphasizing the strength of his empire, which didn't stand in need of any static defenses. What does this say? No defense necessary. It can be seen and is wanted, it's desired to be appreciated by everyone, but this idea of open access is also profound. Paradise is for everyone. Access to this 300 hectare garden city in ancient times would have been through the entrance gate. A 
a freestanding rectangular building which was originally flanked by winged bulls on one side and human-headed bulls on the other. Today, as a result of many earthquakes, torrential rain, savage windstorms and intense heat, the glory of this wonderful structure is all but gone. The only remaining parts are the column bases. The size of these column bases, however, about two by two meters, gives us an insight to the extent of the majestic towering roof. It actually had the highest ceiling of all the palatial buildings at Pasargadi. It was 16 meters high, and it would have struck awe in the hearts of anyone who approached Cyrus's capital going through this very fine portal. Many portals or entrance gates in ancient times displayed sacred symbols. This building also holds the only more or less intact bas relief at the site, which depicts a sacred being. It is very unique and shows a fusion of the cultural values of that period. This bas-relief shows a figure in full profile, wearing Elamite costume, a short beard, and an impressive double-horned crown. And at the top of this relief, uh, there was uh, originally, sadly it's now missing, a trilingual cuneiform inscription in Elamite, Old Persian, and Babylonian, which can be translated, uh, I, Cyrus the King, uh, an Achaemenian, and it's thought that uh, this inscription was added uh, in the reign of Darius because uh, it was at that time that the Old Persian cuneiform script was introduced. Thus, many historians believe that the figure is actually a representation of Cyrus the Great. Abol Kalam Azad, the Indian Minister of Culture at the time of Mahatma Gandhi, had adopted the view that Cyrus could be Zol Karnain, or the Lord of the Two Horns, as mentioned in the Quran. According to our research at the Great Islamic Encyclopedia, we can infer that Cyrus and Zol Karnain of the Quran are the same, very similar to what Alame Tabatabai in his Almizon had reiterated many years ago. Furthermore, his stature could also be seen in his thoughts, deeds, and character, which portray him as a sacred figure, and much more than just a king or an administrator. Cyrus could be considered as a source of inspiration for Iranian thoughtfulness, manners, and culture. And thus, it is a great privilege for us Iranians to have Cyrus as the Quranic Zulkarnay. The outer entrance of the tall portal that held the Cyrus relief was flanked by a pair of winged, human-headed bulls, emphasizing the possibility that this entrance gate might have been the forerunner to the gate of all nations at Persepolis. In such a vast complex, it was perhaps necessary to use horns or trumpets to notify officials of the presence and movement of dignitaries.
drums were very much involved, tried to communicate. It's used for communications then because it was very loud instrument. This one is still not very loud. It's only half the size of a modern trumpet. But if I try to blow it, and if I'm lucky, it might sound a little bit different. Cyrus had carefully designed his gardens not only to delight the eye, but also to enchant the ear with the sound of gently murmuring water. Thus, anyone passing through the entrance gate was welcomed by a beautiful man-made lake and flowing streams. In 2008, we observed that this wide segment of the stream is closed at both ends by a sort of enclosure or dam with a series of small openings to control the water flow. As a result, the stream is in fact transformed into an enchanting man-made lake, 200 meters long and one and a half meters deep. This amazing lake was actually located within the garden and very close to the audience hall. Known for many years as the place of the only surviving intact column at Pasargande, this palace was most probably built to serve as the primary public venue or audience hall for Cyrus and his court. Passing through the porticos and entering the hall, visitors would have been struck by glorious light that streamed from the windows into the elevated space above their head as they went on their way for an audience with the king. Unfortunately, the gift bearers depicted at this palace are now extensively damaged. The best surviving portrayal of gift bearers to the Archimenid court, however, can be found at the eastern portico of the Apadana Palace at Persepolis. This portico is adorned by exquisite reliefs of 23 groups of gift bearers. But was there ever any trace of these wonderful gifts and treasures at Pasargadé? One particular memory I have of Pasargadé is when we were excavating one of the small garden pavilions, and uh, it was within three days of the end of our third and last season. Of 